Hey, how's it going, you fiends? I, myself, am Demi Bobemi. And I'm dead inside. <laughs> and welcome back to another episode of Inheritance. More like Incheritance. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say nonsense, so yours is better. In nonsense. I was going to say shmishmeritance. Fuck. Yeah. Way to just rip Rip, Rip it, it up. up. <laughs> <laughs> I think we got two new things that we say now. Holy <laughs> shit. Somebody <laughs> commented, holy <laughs> shit. Oh, yeah? I want it to be a worldwide phenomenon. And now, rip it up. I've been drinking coffee, so I'm like... Pling. All I had was that Dr. Pepper. I haven't drank any coffee. But it's because I'm trying to go to bed. At an earlier time. Oh, I was like, right now? <laughs> no, just at an earlier time tonight so I can wake up at a decent hour. In my defense, I'm stressed. And so I drank a lot of alcohol yesterday <laughs> <laughs> and stayed up way too late. So it's a pretty good defense. Yeah. Demi. Holy, Holy shit. shit. <laughs> <laughs> you want to give us one of those glorious recaps? Yeah. I lost my watch, so we're going to do it on the phone today. Fuck it. We'll do it live. I think I left my watch in my car. Is that weird? No. I like, I'm pretty sure I left it in my glove box, which I feel like is weird, but whatever. Demi's recap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we got a history lesson. Surprise, surprise. Glader was flying through the air. And then he told us, um... What did he tell us? He just told us about um, other guy, Ormus. He has a bad back because he did super extra magic, zooping them around. And then that's how he didn't get captured by Galatorix. <laughs> um, and then is that how Glader lost his arm? <laughs> <laughs> so that episode didn't stick. No. So we might have to do a dead's recap. Okay. Okay, in my defense, though, it wasn't the last chapter we read, so. True. We recorded another chapter, and then for some reason, our microphones were cutting out, so we have to re-record this chapter. <laughs> that won't make Final Cut, though. <laughs> or it will. Okay. So we'll do a dead's recap. You should sing a song. I was thinking, like, how yours is like, Demi's recap, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mine would be that like, was way more like better. Yeah, I was gonna say more <laughs> musically better than mine was. I was gonna say mine would be like, um, fucking like metal music or something. Can you can you pig squeal anymore? You can't do that anymore. That takes like practice. I'd have to do that not on the spot. Okay. And after practicing for a little bit, I also think I vaped too recently to like, you know, it's like yeah. too, no, I it's get too it. constricted. <laughs> It's just a question. <clears throat> it's just a question. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Holy I'm shit. I'm like, okay, the caffeine is in me. <laughs> also, caffeine and chaos. This is the mug I'm drinking out of, and it's making me feel chaotic. So. Sponsor us. <laughs> <laughs> we need it. <laughs> we need money. <laughs> so in that chapter, mm -hmm. Glader was not flying. <laughs> 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 I'm gonna cry. We'll just start off there. <laughs> okay, okay. Okay. Yep, no, you're right. That checks out. Okay, continue. <laughs> <clears throat> but Glader did tell us a story of how Oramus got injured, but he didn't have a bad back. No, he zooped around, and that's how he got the back. He never had a bad back. <laughs> Wait. Why do I imagine him having a bad back? What's Aragorn wrong? had a bad back. <laughs> <laughs> At one point. <laughs> Does he have like back spasms or something? He would have spasms, yes. But it was probably more like a seizure, like epilepsy or something. Oh, for some reason, I, was, I don't know. Whenever someone like in real life, they'll be like, oh, I have like a back spasm. And that's like where yeah, I'm hearing. But he had like all over body spasms, which is what we would call a seizure. Okay. Yeah, but it's probably not like a seizure seizure because he's probably not like 
<laughs> you know, like foaming out the mouth, going crazy. Okay. He's probably just like. That kind of seems like a seizure, though. <laughs> but there's like there's a difference, you know, because a seizure, you like lose control over your body and you like, you know. Yeah. But in a spasm, it's like a contraction of all of your muscles. Okay, I see. What you're so you're just like. <laughs> you get like a really bad like foot cramp, but it's all over your body. Yes. Okay. But Glader explained how Safira asked Glader how they were not captured, and the explanation that Glader gave was basically Oramis like reatomized them and transferred them through space, potentially even time and space, because oh. the other person was casting a spell to like make it to where uh, Ormus couldn't use magic anymore and was partially successful. So that's why Ormus has spasms. Okay. And but- then he said, <laughs> do not ask me to repeat that story again. But then also... Safira made the decision to go straight across the island instead of up north. And we were, I like mapped it out in the last episode, but we were like a little bit confused exactly like what the debate was about because it didn't really seem like a difference whether they would go north or whether they would just go west. Like there didn't seem to be a big difference. And in fact, it seemed to be more safer to just go north hug the coastline and then jet across. They're like, it'd be like half a day and maybe it would be half a day, but half a day for your safety versus risking it for the biscuit. The juice isn't worth the squeeze on that, but yeah. So that's okay. Dead's in depth recap. Okay. Should have given you like a time limit. <clears throat> I don't need it. Oh, okay. If I have to recap, then we might as well spend the time on it. <laughs> My recap is going to be like... (laughs) I just, for some reason, couldn't remember if that was when they made the decision to fly over the ocean or not. I couldn't remember if that was in flight over the ocean, which we haven't even read yet. So I don't know why I thought that could have been a possibility. Awesome. (laughs) (laughs) I clearly did not enjoy that chapter as much as i've enjoyed other chapters i liked it because it gave the explanation of how orm is but i feel like we could have got that at a different point but i I mean whatever when you're putting a little history nugget in there you can get it really at any point if there's downtime it shows the passage of time and journey and and does it in a way to where you you're staying Mm -hmm. you're getting something out of it I feel like I need to be more aware in my own personal life how much I'm giving history lessons. You know what I mean? Complaining or explaining? Listen. Because I'm like, well, what if in like the way that we're reading this, I'm like, what if I just feel like these are like history lessons and it's like really annoying and nobody does this? But I'm like, how many times have I been like, oh, when I was little and I like tell you like a thing that happened like in my personal history? You just regale me with a history lesson. Oh, no. Uh oh. My eye just started twitching. (laughs) (laughs) In the last episode, I don't think I had a haircut. And now that I got my haircut, it's actually a pretty decent haircut. Mm -hmm. And me and Demi did it. Call me for your next... Book your your appointments now. Book your appointments now. She will... You have to pay for the flight for her to come to you. Um, (laughs) But she'll cut your hair. (laughs) I have a really long history of cutting hair. I've done it twice. She so. can only cut the back. I did the sides. So So you're on your own for the sides. Unless you want to hire me to do your sides. <laughs> yeah. You get a discount if you hire both of us. Yep. Most expensive haircut you'll <laughs> ever have. And it will not be worth it. <laughs> Chapter 45. The sound of his voice. The touch of his hand. That just sounds too fucking romantic for this book like you know what i mean yeah it does it sounds like it should be like a 50 shades of gray chapter it's it's like i i get it that's like probably 50 shades of green (laughs) (laughs) you know what i mean but whatever Uh. (laughs) (laughs) 
Will you swear you're filthy to me in the ancient language? Never. (laughs) Never. Never. His question and her answer had become a ritual between them, a call and response such as children might use in a game, except that in this game, she lost, even when she won. Kind of sounds like you're losing then. Yeah. That's, that's, you're just losing. It's <laughs> like me, though, when I'm like, yeah, but I was like right about this. And you're like, yeah, but you weren't right, though. I'm like, but I was like half right. And you're like, you're either right or you're wrong. Yeah, it's a one or a zero. <sighs> Rituals were all that allowed Naswada to maintain her sanity. By them, she ordered her world. By them, she was able to endure from one moment to the next. For they gave her something to hold on to when all else had been stripped from her. Rituals of thought, rituals of action, rituals of pain and relief. These had become the framework upon which her life depended. Without them, she would have been lost, a sheep without a shepherd, a devotee bereft of faith, a rider separated from her dragon. Yeah, but like rituals, is this how everybody conducts their life? Yeah. It's like, that's nothing new. Everybody has rituals. Yeah, like almost everything I feel like anyone does ever is like a some kind of ritual. Whatever, I guess it sounds good on paper. (laughs) Unfortunately, this particular ritual always ended in the same way, with another touch of the iron. She screamed and bit her tongue, and blood filled her mouth. She coughed, trying to clear her throat, but there was too much blood and she began to choke. Her lungs burned from a lack of air, and the lines on the ceiling wavered and grew dim, and then her memory ceased and there was nothing, not even darkness. Afterward, Galbatorik spoke to her while the irons heated. This, too, had become one of their rituals. He had healed her tongue, or at least she thought it had been him and not Murtag, for as he said, it wouldn't do if you were unable to speak, now would it? How else will I know when you are ready to serve me? As before, the king sat to her right at the very edge of her vision, where all she could see of him was a gold-edged shadow, his form partially hidden beneath the long, heavy cape he wore. I met your father, you know, when he was steward of Enduriel's chief estate, said Galbatorix. Did he tell you of that? She shuddered and closed her eyes, and felt tears seep from the corners. She hated listening to him. His voice was too powerful, too seductive. It left her wanting to do whatever he desired just so she could hear him utter a tiny morsel of praise. Yes, she murmured. I took... Weird. What? It's just, like, weird that she would want to hear even praise from his mouth. I wouldn't want to fucking hear anything. He's just got that kind of voice, you know? He's got that smooth, silky voice that just, you know... What what did, what did was the description? Mephliflous or whatever? Furflurflu. Superfluous? <laughs> That's a different word, but it's something like mellifer. Yeah. Mellifer. Mellifer. <laughs> Definitely mellifer. <laughs> Mellifluous. Mephliflous. Mephliflous. I can't McFlurry. remember. McFlurious. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> McFlurious. He had that McFlurious voice. I wonder if his he's enchanted his voice. Oh, well, maybe. To be like, and I'm going to use this word, but I don't mean it in like a sexual way. But like, I wonder if he's like enchanted it to be like seductive in a way to like bewitch people. Ooh. You know what I mean? To like make them want to like please him basically. Hmm. Maybe he just has one of those voices. But it seems more likely that he would have, like, enchanted his voice. If it's, like, smooth and, like, brown sugar buttery. I don't know why that is. Molasses? (laughs) Molasses? It's, like, brown sugar buttery. It's kind of just, like, molasses. That feels good, right? Molasses? Not if you're covered in it. That's true. A it bunch really of people did drown in molasses. It doesn't once. taste good either. It's only good for like rum. It's good if you add sugar to it and turn it okay, into rum. <laughs> okay, <go>. anyway. <laughs> what are you trying to say? <laughs> Get to your point already, okay? You, I don't know what my point was now. Because <laughs> you just wanted to talk about molasses. <laughs> you interjected at the wrong time. I didn't want to talk time. about molasses. <laughs> my brain did when you brought it up. Okay, so. just go. <laughs> I <can't. laughs> All right, we're continuing reading then. (laughs) 
I took little notice of him at the time. Why would I? He was a servant, no one of significance. And Duriel allowed him a fair bit of freedom, the better to manage the affairs of the estate. Too much freedom, as it turned out. The king made a dismissive gesture, and the light caught his lean, claw-like hand. And Duriel always was overly permissive. It was his dragon who was the cunning one, and Duriel merely did as he was told. What a strange, amusing series of events fate has arranged. To think, the man who saw to it that my boots were brightly polished went on to become my foremost enemy after Brahm, and now here you are, his daughter, returned to Urubayan, and about to enter my service, even as did your father. How very ironic. Would you not agree? Literally rude. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's pretty shitty. Also, I mean, as if he's not a master in manipulation, but it's like, how hard would that be to hear? Because she, it hasn't even been a year. Like, she just lost her father and had to assume his position and his power. Like, truly, what time has she had to grieve? And then there's this person who's just being like, he was this insignificant, like, fleck of dirt, you know? That would just be awful and this motherfucker knows what he's doing too he's trying to hurt her get her emo get her into an emotive um space an emotional response mm -hmm. into an emotive like to, space yeah because when you're emotive you don't make good choices you lose all rationale holy <laughs> shit <laughs> i should know my father escaped, and he nearly killed Durza when he did. She said, All your spells and oaths could not hold him any more than you'll be able to hold me. She thought Galbatorix might have frowned. Yes, that was unfortunate. Durza was quite put out about it at the time. Family seemed to make it easier for people to change who they are, and thus their true names, which is why I now choose my household servants only from those who are barren and unwed. However, you are solely mistaken if you think to slip your bonds. The only ways to leave the Hall of the Soothsayer are by swearing loyal to me or by dying. Then I will die. How very short-sighted. The gilded shadow of the king leaned toward her. Have you ever entertained the thought, Nasawada, that the world would have been, that the world would have been worse off had I not overthrown the riders? The riders kept the peace, she said. They protected the whole of Alagazia from war, from plague, from the threat of shades. In times of famine, they brought food to the starving. How is this land a better place without them? Because there was a price attached to their service. You of all people should know that everything in this world must be paid for, whether in gold, time, or blood. Nothing is without its price, not even the riders, especially not the riders. Aye, they kept the peace, but they also stifled the races of this land, the elves and dwarves just as much as us humans. What is always said in praise of the riders when the bards bemoan their passing? That the rain extended for thousands of years, and that during this much vaunted golden age, little changed besides the names of the kings and queens who sat smug and secure upon their thrones. Oh, there were little alarms, a shade here, an incursion by Urgles there, a skirmish between two dwarf clans over a mine no one but they cared about. But on the whole, the order of things remained exactly the same as it had been when the riders first rose to prominence. She heard the clink of metal against metal as Murtag stirred the coals in the brazier. She wished she could see his face so that she could gauge his reaction to Galbatorix's words. But as was his habit, he stood with his back to her, staring down at the coals. The only time he looked at her was when he had to apply the white-hot metal to her flesh. That was his particular ritual, and she suspected he needed it as much as she needed hers. And still, Gabatorix kept talking. He'll wind himself out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> um, or wind. I keep saying wind, but it's wind. I mean, I guess I can understand. It's like wind down, wind out. Um... You look busy. Hello? Hi. <laughs> Were you done talking? 
I don't know. <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I just feel like, I don't know. Never what? mind. I just can't remember anything. I'm like, I get distracted and then I'm derailed. But <laughs> Mood. <clears throat> and still, Galbatorx kept talking. I don't know why I said it like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, I was going to say how he was saying, like, nothing is free. And it's like, truly, like, nothing in this world is free. Even if they say it's free. Like, shit ain't free. Somebody you know always I mean? has to pay for it. And it's Jeremy Beautiful Stop. Chest. Stop. Why? <laughs> I don't know. I just feel like we always say that and nobody gets it. Okay, well, then You can't watch. just keep saying Jer Jeremy Beautiful Chest is the one that has to pay. Like, everyone just goes. Okay, well, then watch luxury comedy. And you'll get it. Yeah. Okay, so continue your point. <sighs> I need you to give me, like, ten seconds. All right, I'm going to drink water and hit my vape. That's like 10 okay. seconds worth of time. <laughs> Five, <laughs> four. <laughs> you wasted your 10 seconds in this fucking thing. <laughs> I told you I needed to, I was trying to tell you I need to gather my thoughts. Mm. That's the whole thing. That's all I was doing was trying to like I think. I thought you were going to talk. <laughs> no. <clears throat> That's funny. I don't know. I would just, yep, every, people have to pay. Nothing's free. Does that not seem the most evil thing to you, Nasawada? Life is change, and yet the writer suppressed it so that the land lay in an uneasy slumber, unable to shake off the chains that bound it, unable to advance or retreat as nature intended. Unable to become something new. I saw with my own eyes scrolls in the vaults at Vroengard and here in the vaults of Illyria that detailed discoveries, magical, mechanical, and from every sphere of natural philosophy, discoveries that the writers kept hidden because they feared what might happen if those things became generally known. The writers were cowards, wedded to an old way of life and an old way of thinking, determined to defend it until their dying breath. Theirs... A gentle tyranny, but a tyranny, nevertheless. Okay. <laughs> Please, Miss Demi Bobemi. <laughs> so, um, firstly, um, remind me, aliens. Secondly, I have to say I this. <laughs> like, so this is like a <laughs> sidebar. <laughs> Fucking write it down on your hand or something. Oh my god. Okay, so I heard that somebody said that if you have ADHD and you're trying to not interrupt someone, you should have like a gesture so that you can like basically like signal physically that you're trying to like hold your place and you have something to say and you're like not trying to interrupt. Mine's this. <laughs> like I'm going to talk. <laughs> so I think <clears throat> that that's why I have like an inclination to raise my hand while people are talking is that I feel like it sends that physical You need like a little stick or like a flag. Like a little auction paddle yeah it just says me need talk <laughs> <laughs> um but like i f so he's like oh they're trying to keep the information from the people and that's wrong where i don't inherently disagree with him i think that people deserve whatever transparency transparency however so for a hundred billion years, whatever, like people, I think generally have like suspected or known aliens exist because how could we possibly be alone in this vast universe? And then like governments all over the world, right? We're like, yeah, we've been keeping it secret. Aliens be real dog or whatever, whether you believe it's legitimate information or not. Right. And it's like, cause the whole point of keeping aliens secret, right. was like mass panic was like, you don't want to just be like, hey, aliens just came and visited us because everyone would be like, why? What the fuck? They have boats with guns, <laughs> yeah. gunboats. You know what I mean? Because <laughs> it's like individually, people are smart. As a whole, people are stupid. Wow, it's like you watch Men in Black or something. Is that from Men in Black? Yeah, like you almost said it verbatim, what he says. Humans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a 
good bead on things. Mm. Well, why, why the big secret? People are smart. They can handle it. A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. It has probably been 20 years since I've seen Men in Black. That must have, like, really burrowed itself deep in my brain. I think it came out in, like, 98. No, 92? Hey, Google, when did Men in Black come out? 97? So, so yeah. it's probably been almost 20 years since yeah. I've seen that movie. That's fucking whack. Okay. Anyway, but it's like, that makes sense, though. Like, people in power aren't just going to voluntarily give people information that, like, could potentially make them panic. Right. So, like, I get what he's saying. Like, oh, they should have all the knowledge. But it's like, like, should they? Or, like, <clears throat> could the knowledge potentially be, like, not just dangerous to the dragon riders, but be dangerous to, like, I don't know, the fucking world as a whole? You know what I mean? Like, should you really just be, like, being like, here, books on becoming a shade for everybody? You know? Like how Dumbledore censored some books from the uh, the restricted section, like Horcrux books. Mm -hmm. So you agree with that type of censorship is what it is for the greater good. Oof. Oof. Oh. This will make Final Cut. Oh, wow. wow. <laughs> <laughs> but like... But then when you put it that way, I'm like, who am I to fucking decide what people can and cannot do with information? You know? That's why you, like, appoint experts in the field of those areas to create sort of like a governing board that make those decisions for the people based off the people. But <laughs> absolute power corrupts absolutely. So, you know... What do you do? <laughs> You'll catch 2020 right there. You'll pickle in a s pickle sandwich or something. <laughs> what the fuck? Were murder and betrayal really the solution, though? She asked, not caring if he punished her for it. He laughed, seeming genuinely amused. Such hypocrisy. You condemn me for the very thing you seek to do. If you could, you would kill me where I sit, and with no more hesitation than were I a rabid dog. You're a traitor. I'm not. I am the victor. In the end, nothing else matters. We are not so different as you think, Naswada. That just reminds me of, like, Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire <laughs> and Willem Dafoe mm -hmm. when he's, like, in the goblin outfit or whatever, and he's like, You and I, were not so different. It's like the goblin's monologue to... Spider-Man. I love villain monologues. They're the best. Um, ooh, I saw you the quote from Dark Knight when he says, you either die a hero or you live long enough to become a villain. Yep. Somebody said that that was their favorite movie quote because it actually is in line with um, like, a psycho like a psychological like theory that the longer you convince yourself you're doing something for good, it turns evil, basically. That you will stop at nothing to do what you think is right, in turn becoming the villain that you were basically fighting. Because <clears throat> you sacrifice your own morality, essentially. Yeah. I just thought that was interesting. So that's, like, real. Like, Galbatorix might have not been wrong in the beginning. At first. At first, he was probably right and had a good idea. And was, like, righteous in his pursuits, but he was the victor, you know? He, like... And then he probably suffered from cognitive dissonance and couldn't really... He's, like, in too deep, you know? Yeah. And he's like... Ah, I've gone too far. <laughs> I'm the victor. It doesn't matter, you know? Yeah. I am the victor. In the end, nothing else matters. We are not so different as you think, Nasawada. You wish to kill me because you believe my death would be an improvement for Alagazia, and because you, who are still almost a child, believe you can do a better job of ruling the Empire than I. Your arrogance would cause others to despise you, but not me. 
for I understand. I took up arms against the riders for those very same reasons, and I was right to do so. Did vengeance have nothing to do with it? She thought he smiled. It might have provided the initial inspiration, but neither hate nor revenge was my guiding motive. I was concerned by what the riders had become and convinced, as I still am, that only when they were gone could we flourish as a race. For a moment, the pain from her wounds made it impossible for her to talk. Then she managed to whisper, If what you say is true, and I have no cause to believe you, but if it is, then you are no better than the writers. You pillaged their libraries and gathered up their stores of knowledge, and as of yet, you have shared none of that lore with anyone else. He moved nearer to her, and she felt his breath upon her ear. That is because, scattered throughout the horde of secrets, I found hints of a greater truth, a truth that could provide an answer to one of the most perplexing questions in history. A shiver ran down her spine. What question? He leaned back in his chair and tugged at the edge of his cape. The question of how a king or a queen can enforce the laws they enact when there are those among their subjects who can use magic. When I realized what the hints alluded to, I put aside all else and committed myself to hunting down this truth, this answer, for I knew it was of paramount importance. That is why I have kept the writer's secrets to myself. I have been busy with my search. The answer to this problem must be set into place before I make known any of the other discoveries. The world is already a troubled place, and it is better to soothe the waters before disturbing them once more. It took me nearly a hundred years to find the information I needed, and now that I have, I shall use it to reshape the whole of Allegasia. Even that, though, is not logically sound, and you could easily rebuke that, that he hasn't shared any of this wonderful information with people because he's afraid of, like, magic users. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, what about, like, the good things that you could share that wouldn't have a consequence of people using magic? Because you could say, like, oh, there's a magical spell that helps you filter water. Everybody gets clean water now. Or, like... Here's a spell that will help people build better mechanical systems. Like, or, you know, just like whatever. I can only think of like what, because they were talking about like tech mechanical things mm -hmm. and stuff. Like, why can't you release those that have like no bearing on? The only thing I could think is that because the magic users, not that Aragon has like no knowledge, but he definitely has limited knowledge. Like he hasn't had the training that he probably should have by this point, you know, under normal circumstances. So like he has to get very creative with the knowledge he knows. Right. So you, so by Galbatorix giving out literally any magical knowledge that they don't already have, like people could get too creative with that knowledge, I think. Because, like, you know what I mean? I guess. <clears throat> I mean, it just depends on what he releases because you, you know, it just depends on the information that he does release. But if he's, like, such a good guy and trying to, like, better everybody, then why wouldn't he just, like, release some of the information that wouldn't have, is my argument. Like, why wouldn't he release the information that wouldn't have negative reactions like simple things that say like look i am your king i'm giving you things well right so i guess the way i look at it is if there are people and i'm like well i could put nails in their toolbox so they can like build better structures but like you know what you can also do with those nails make a fucking weapon you know what i mean you could pound those nails into a board and use it as a weapon so, like, my thought for him is, like, he doesn't want to add any potential because, like, he's not as fucking omniscient as he thinks he is. Like, somebody could, like, think of something maybe he didn't think of and then use that to their advantage and undermine his power in some way. Like, he's obviously, like, delusional at this point. He doesn't want anyone to undermine his power in any way and someone using a water filtering spell to d 
do something else, maybe like sift all of the gold out of a creek bed or something, and now they're like wealthy. <clears throat> hmm. I still don't agree with that. Okay. Magic is the great injustice in the world. It would not be so unfair if the ability only occurred among those who were weak, for then it would be a compensation for what chance or circumstance had robbed them of. But it doesn't. The strong are just likely to be able to use magic, and they gain more from it besides. One need only look to the elves to see this is true. The problem is not confined to individuals. It also plagues the relationships between the races. The elves find it easier than us to maintain order within their society, for most every elf can use magic, and therefore few of them are ever at the mercy of another. In this regard, they are fortunate, but it is not so fortunate for us, for the dwarves, or even the accursed Urgles. We have only been able to live here in Allegasia because the elves permitted it, if they wanted they could have swept us from the face of the earth as easily as a flood might sweep away an anthill. But no more. Not while I'm here to oppose their might. The riders would never have let them kill us or drive us away. No. But while the riders existed, we were dependent upon their goodwill, and it is not right that we should have to rely on others for our safekeeping. The riders began as a means to keep the peace between elves and dragons, but in the end... Their main purpose became upholding the rule of law throughout the land. They were, however, insufficient to the task, as are my own spellcasters, the Black Hand. The problem is too far-reaching for any one group to combat. My own life is proof enough of that. Even if there were a trustworthy band of spellcasters adept enough to watch over all of the other magicians in Allegasia, ready to intervene at the slightest hint of malfeasance, we would still be reliant upon the very ones whose powers we sought to restrain. Ultimately, the land would be no safer than it is now. No. In order to solve this problem, it must be addressed on a deeper, more fundamental level. The ancients knew how that might be done, and now, so do I. Galbatorix shifted in the chair, and she caught a sharp gleam from his eye, as from a lantern, as from a lantern set deep within a cave. I shall make it so that no magician will be able to harm another person, whether human, dwarf, or elf. None shall be able to cast a spell unless they have permission, and only magics that are benign and beneficial shall be allowed. Even the elves will be bound by this precept, and they shall learn to measure their words carefully, or speak not at all. And who will grant permission? She asked. Who will decide what is allowed and what is not? You? Someone must. It was I who recognized what was needed. I who discovered the means, and I who shall implement them. You sneer at the thought? Well then, ask yourself this, Nasawada. Have I been a bad king? Be honest now. By the standards of my forebears, I have not been excessive. You have been cruel. That is not the same thing. You have led the Varden... You understand the burdens of command. Surely you have to realize the threat that magic poses to the stability of any kingdom. To give but one example, I have spent more time laboring over the enchantments that protect the coin of the realm from being forged than I have upon most any other aspect of my duties. And yet, no doubt, there is a clever-minded conjurer somewhere who has found a way to circumvent my wards and who is busy making bags of lead coins with which he can fool nobles and commoners alike. Why else do you think I have been so careful to restrict the use of magic throughout the empire? Because it is a threat to you. No. There, you are exactly wrong. It is no threat to me. No one and nothing is. However, spellcasters are are a threat to the proper functioning of this realm, and that I shall not tolerate. Once I have bound every magician in the world to the laws of the land, imagine the peace and prosperity that shall reign. No more shall men or dwarves have to fear elves. No more shall writers be able to impose their will on others. No more shall those who cannot use magic be prey for those who can. 
Alagazia will be transformed, and with our newfound safety, we will build a more wondrous tomorrow, one you could be part of. This dude is like, oh, the dragon rider is imposing their will, literally what he's doing. He's like, yeah, those fucking dragon riders and fucking person that rides a dragon that has magical abilities that's super strong imposing their will upon everybody else what a f what fucking dicks let's fucking get rid of them and then Nasawada's is like do you not see the irony here <laughs> am i the only one um but sir <laughs> <laughs> but then it's like also i don't think that like i mean yeah you could argue that like humans are kind of like shitty but I don't think inherently people are, like, bad. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think at anyone's, like, core for the most part that they're, like, bad people and they're, like, trying to, like, fuck everybody over. I think most people are just trying to, like, live their lives. Spellcaster, no. Like, you're going to have people who abuse their power, <clears throat> like Albatorix. But you're also going to have a lot of people who just really aren't. You know what I mean? Like... Aragon is, like, adept at healing. Like, he's so weirdly good at it. Like, hell. <laughs> like, you'd have people like that just, like, going into, like, doctor positions, I guess you could say. Like, being, like, healers for their town. Like, I don't think... Like, he clearly, whether he is conscious of it or not, feels threatened. You know what I mean? Like, I don't... I mean, he says... No threat to me. No one and nothing is. And he's only talking about how he believes that there's a threat to the proper functioning of the realm. <clears throat> Which it sounds more like he's afraid of the threat of his own control over people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if I've just been seeing a lot of like psychology TikToks or what, but I definitely feel qualified to like diagnose this man. <laughs> Psychoanalyze him. But it's like. The realm, Allegasia, is like an extension of himself. Oh, shit. Okay. I, it's like he... Holy shit. Okay, listen. But he's like being like, I've molded <clears throat> it and I'm like progressing it. And he feels like the realm is basically an extension of himself. And, his people, and the people are his subjects. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's like, so therefore, there, he is threatened by these people that could take some of his power away and then you know what i mean like yeah. he's he's just fucking threatened and i think that he's actually delusional if he thinks that he's not threatened well then his whole idea and his whole concept of <clears throat> making it to where people can't do something mm -hmm. is like kind of counterintuitive because there's going to be people that will find a way around it. And then those mm -hmm. people will have even more power over those people that don't, that haven't figured it out. Yeah. It's kind of like, <clears throat> it kind of mirrors a um, arms argument, mm -hmm. like a gun firearm argument that if you took away everybody's weapons, then only criminals would have weapons left. And so the criminals would be like the most powerful. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so Galbatorx is like, well, I'm going to take away everybody's ability to do harmful magic and take away everybody's guns. And then there's going to be that one clever magician that already figured out how to change his lead into gold or whatever the yeah. fuck you're saying <clears throat> that figures out how to circumvent spells right because it's like is it really that hard to like circumvent a spell that means you can't do damage to somebody it's like okay well then i'll just like then i'll zap that tree and the tree will fall on you that was like you know literally what, I mean? what i was thinking of stop i was thinking not zap that tree i was thinking like chop the tree down with magic and then like f guide the tree to fall on a person mm -hmm. but you know it's like we're not even thinking about it really and we've already like come up with the circumvent to that yeah, it's just so, like, I don't... So then those people that have that cleverness are already at, like, a more advantageous position. But that's just, like, life. People are at more advantageous positions than you are and more disadvantageous. Mm -hmm. The idea of, like, life isn't for a governing body to enforce its will upon the people to try to make everybody more equal. It's for yeah. the people to raise those that are disadvantaged up 
as much as they can and then the you know well yeah because he's like basically like taking away their right to bear arms and defend themselves he right is, to use magic yeah yeah and then bear magic and defend themselves i mean right though <clears throat> i'm pretty sure it's their second amendment right it might be <laughs> but then he's also like censoring them like what they can and cannot do. He's doing, he's getting their first and second amendment rights in one fucking swoop. Get it, boy. I just don't. And then like, I just, I know that like sometimes people are like, yeah, but like life isn't, like life isn't fair. Like let's make it more fair. But it's like, life isn't fair. Like compared to what? <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, compared to how it could be, I guess. Well, then everything would be unfair to what it could, what anything well, could right, be. Well, right, that's what it's just like. This bottle's unfair to what it could be. You know, and it's just like, I don't know, because that's like his argument is like life is unfair, so I'm gonna make it fair, and it's like. But like, what it sounds like is, really, what it sounds like is a child. He sounds like a juvenile like he does sound like an actual it's unfair i want chicken nuggy <laughs> you know and then it's just like i don't know it's just like weird because okay ken so he's like people some people can use magic and some people can't is that so really people can or can anyone learn magic or you can't learn magic i don't know I mean, like, what we were explained to before with magic is that, like, most every single human can't use magic, that you have to be a sorcerer and you have to, like, you have to, like, trap spirits and use their energy to use magic. Writers can tap into the dragon magic. Right, the Dragons arcane. are the ones that are, like, naturally in tune with the world energy mm -hmm. or arcane. And then by being a writer and fused with the dragon you can do that and then the pact that the elves and dragons made long ago made it to where every elf could do dragon magic so they're really just dragon people that's kind of cool and dwarves are just fucked no they can use magic yeah dwarves can use magic so i wonder how that works that's not explained ever but it seems like that was the explanation we got, but then Galbatorix's understanding of magic is that it just randomly pops up in people. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's a thing too. So like you're just mad at RNG then? I don't know. But my solution is just give everybody magic. Let everybody have magic all on an even fighting ground. But see, then that would threaten his power and his control over the realm. Well, be fucking better then. Be stronger. Be more fair. Well, don't have people be mad at you then. But like, give I don't... the people circuses, give them what they demand. What's happening? I'm leaning into it. Oh I'm God. I'm going to rip it up. <laughs> <laughs> but like, he couldn't possibly give the people more tools because then that threatens his power and control over the realm. Only if you're unfair and unjust. But I think for him, whether he's like acknowledged that or not, I think that deep down that's what he fears is the loss of control and power. And he can't possibly give people more tools to potentially <clears throat> threaten that. Right. So he has to take everybody's tools away. Fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Allegasians. Well, luckily someone's going to swoop in and save them all. Like literally... He's going to swoop in on a blue dragon. You think so? Unless there's going to be the biggest fucking plot twist of my life and like someone else. Murtag saves the realm or something. But no, that's not this story. Or there's another hidden dragon rider. If we already gone done did that. But Can another one. Another one. Another one. <clears throat> Enter into my service, Nasawada. And you will have the opportunity to oversee the creation of a world such as never existed before. A world where a man will stand or fall based upon the strength of his limbs and the keenness of his mind, and not whether chance has granted him skill with magic. 
Man may build up his limbs and man may improve his mind, but never can he learn to use magic if he was born lacking the ability. But, as I said, <laughs> magic is the great injustice and for the good of all. I will impose limits upon every magician there is. She stared at the lines on the ceiling and tried to ignore him. So much of what he said was similar to what she had thought herself. He was right. Magic was the most destructive force in the world, and if it could be regulated, Allegasia would be better would be a better place for it. She hated that there was nothing to stop Aragon from blue, red, patterns of interwoven color, the throbbing of her burns. She strove desperately to concentrate upon anything other than the nothing. Whatever she had been about to think she already thought it of was nothing did not exist yeah it's like not how thoughts work yeah before just, we get on that whole tangent um okay nah we're not even like halfway so what's the tangent it's not how thoughts work well i was gonna say <clears throat> like he is well i mean yeah that's not how thoughts work like when someone's like don't think of elephant you think of elephant because that's not how our brains work um but, well, to like highlight that thought more, because that's surface level. Mm -hmm. When you say like, don't think of an elephant, you already thought of an elephant as soon as I said elephant. But even the person that said, don't think of an elephant had already had the thought in their mind of don't think of elephant before they audibly said it in their mind mm -hmm. to say it. And then before they even said it. So before it even makes it to your mouth, you've already thought about it at least three times. Yeah. So when yeah. you're like laying there and you're like, e uh, even Aragon could. And then you're like, oh, don't think about it. It's like you already thought about it. Yeah. And then you already had to think about not thinking about like it's. So then you already late. thought about it twice before you even decided not to think about it. But also, OK, another thing is like whatever she's like about to not think about or whatever <laughs> whatever she's thinking about not thinking about yeah um or whatever she's about to think about not thinking about right <laughs> she already thought about it <laughs> galbatorx already told her all the shit he knows he's like i literally already f the the glader rock yeah eldenari yeah he already knows about that yeah so i'm just like what like what are you that and that was like their big like mic drop too yeah like we got a fucking el dunari keep it hidden from him and then like we also have a dothar keep that hidden from him and he's like uh el dunari and dothar sup everything's yeah. on the table what else you got nothing yeah like, like i know every fucking thing so it just makes me wonder like what information could she possibly conjure how, what information could she possibly think about not thinking about that he doesn't already fucking know about? I know she can't like know what he does or doesn't know, but it's like, they are two like big bomb things of like Glader Eldenari, Doth Dart, he already fucking knows about. So like, what else do they even have? I guess it's better to play it safe, though, because those could just be two big things that he does know about, but maybe he doesn't know about some smaller things that could potentially, like, have right, be like big ramifications. Ticket. Because it's always, like, sometimes, like, those little things that really give your opponent the leverage over you that you don't even recognize as a thing or a weakness or mm -hmm. a place for them to put their... I was trying to use like a hand grip analogy, but I was going to say place to put their fingers, but that sounds weird. <laughs> <laughs> nah, I like it. A hand grip in your defenses, you know? Yeah, if you know what I mean. Oh my God. <laughs> Moving on. You call me evil. You curse my name and seek to overthrow me. But remember this, Nasawada. It was not I who started this war. And I am not responsible for those who have lost their lives as a result. I did not seek this out. You did. I would have been content to devout myself to my studies. But the Varden insisted upon stealing Saphira's egg from my treasure house. And you and your kind are responsible for all of the blood. And you and your kind are responsible for all of the blood and sorrow that have followed. You are the ones, after all who have been rampaging across the countryside, 
burning and pillaging as you please. Not I. And yet, you have the audacity to claim that I am in the wrong. Were you to go into the homes of the peasants, they would tell you that it is a Varden they fear most. They would talk about how they look to my soldiers for protection and how they hope the Empire will defeat the Varden and all shall be as it was. Kind of sounds like he's playing like the victim card there a little bit. Also, propaganda is on his side. <clears throat> right. So, okay. Also, can I just say, because I was going to say this before, but then I forgot, but now I remembered. I thought about thinking about it. Um, One of my favorite things is when the villain tells the good guy how they're the same. You know, it's like the one trope that's like my favorite fucking thing is when the villain convinces the good guy that they're the same and that like but there's a blaring difference. There is like a blaring difference. But like, I just love They're like, yeah, except that like one thing that you forgot to mention that you're delusional. <laughs> but it's like, I mean, because they're like, yeah, he's wrong and we can all agree he's wrong. But he, like he does have like good points of like their similarities like, she is marching her entire army across Allegasia, like, taking supplies, killing people, taking over villages, and, like, all They the do offer the chance, though. Yeah, they do. Of peace. Um, but, like, I mean, at the end of the day, like, that they are doing those things. They do give people the choice, obviously, but it's, like, you know, all, all in the name of what's right. You know what I mean? I just always love like s those parallels being like pointed out that nothing is just black and white, you know, mm -hmm. nothing is just good. Nothing is just bad that there are those similarities. And that's my favorite thing in stories when that happens. <laughs> Thank you. For Thanks for coming to my <laughs> TED talk. <laughs> Nasawada wet her lips. Even though she knew her boldness might cost her, she said, it seems to me you protest too much. If the welfare of your subjects were your main concern, you would have flown out to confront the Varden weeks ago instead of letting an army roam loose within your borders. That is, unless you are not so sure of your might as you pretend. Or it is you fear the elves will take Urubayan while you are gone. As had become her habit, she spoke of the Varden as if she knew no more about them than any random person in the Empire. Galbatoric shifted, and she could tell he was about to respond. But she was not yet finished. And what of the Urgles? You cannot convince me your cause is just when you would exterminate an entire race in order to ease your pain at the death of your first dragon. Have you no answer for that, Oathbreaker? Speak to me of the dragons, then. Explain why you slew so many that you doomed their kind to a slow and inevitable extinction. And finally, explain your mistreatment of the Eldenari you captured. In her anger, she allowed herself that one slip. You have bent and broken them and chained them to your will. There is no rightness in what you do, only selfishness and a never-ending hunger for power. Galbatorix regarded her in silence for a long, uncomfortable while. Then she saw his outline move as he crossed his arms. I think the irons ought to be sufficiently hot by now, Murtag, if you would. She clenched her fists, digging her nails into her skin, and her muscles began to tremble despite her best efforts to hold them still. One of the iron rods scraped against the lip of the brazier as Murtag pulled it free. He turned to face her, and she could not help but stare at the tip of glowing metal. Then she looked into Murtag's eyes, and she saw the guilt and self-loathing they contained, and a sense of profound sorrow overcame her. What fools we are, she thought. What sorry, miserable fools. After that, she had no more energy for thinking, and so she fell back to her well-worn rituals, clinging to them for survival, even as a drowning man might cling to a piece of wood. Um, I don't know if Christopher Pellini did this on purpose, or if he just did it by gut. Um, there's just, like, that little detail of Gabatorix, like, crossing his arms and, like, leaning back, which... Like, crossing your arms is, like, a form of, like, self-soothing. Self so it's, like, like giving yourself a hug, kind of, to, like, make yep. yourself feel better. Which yep. means, like, she fucking got him. She fucking... And then, like, him making physical distance between them. That was she, very well written. Oh! <laughs> oh, 
baby Paulini. Woo! Okay. <laughs> that like, just like that moment of like <clears throat> fucking gotcha. And then he didn't even have to say anything. Like the physical show don't, show don't tell. You know what I mean? Like that was just like good. Felt good. And then how he just goes. I think the irons ought to be sufficiently hot, Murtag, if you would. Oh, God. And he just lashes out like a, the child he is, you know? He seems like Gal Baby, you know? We kept calling him Galby. Mm-hmm. But I think it's Gal Baby. Little Gal Baby boy. Little Gal Baby boy. When Murtag and Gal Baby departed, <sighs> she was in too much pain to do more than gaze mindlessly at the patterns on the ceiling while she struggled not to cry. She was sweating and shivering at the same time as if she had a fever, and she found it impossible to concentrate upon any one thing for more than a few seconds. You're in shock, honey. <laughs> the pain from her burns did not subside as it would have if she had been cut or bruised. Indeed, the throbbing from her wounds seemed to grow worse with time. She closed her eyes and concentrated upon slowing her breathing as she tried to calm her body. The first time Galbatorix and Murtek had visited her, she had been far more courageous. She had cursed and taunted and done all she could to hurt them with her words. However, through Murtag, Galbatorix had made her suffer for her insolence and she had soon lost her taste for open rebellion. The iron made her timid. Even the memory of it made her want to curl into a tight little ball. During their second most recent visit, she had said as little as possible until her final imprudent outburst. She had tried to test Galbatorix's claim that neither he nor Murtag would lie to her. She did this by asking them questions about the Empire's inner workings, facts that her spies had informed her of, but that Galbatorix had no reason to believe she knew. So far as she could determine, Galbatorix and Murtag had told her the truth. But she was not about to trust anything the king said, when there was no way to verify his claims. As for Murtag, she was not quite so sure... When he was with the king, she gave no credence to his words. But when he was by himself... He was a chatty Cathy. Well, I think, it, yeah. Also, just... <clears throat> she probably, like, didn't listen to him when she was with Galbator... Or mm -hmm. when he was with Galbatorix, but then by himself. I mean, right, she yeah. Did. There's nobody around for him to, like... You know, imp not impress, but... Whatever, you know what I mean. There's nobody for him to be subject to. Right, yeah. <laughs> Several hours after her first agonizing audience with King Galbatorix, when she had at long last fallen into a shallow, troubled sleep, Murtag had come alone to the hall of the soothsayer, bleary-eyed and smelling of drink. He had stood by the monolith upon which she lay, and he had stared at her with such a strange, tormented expression, she had not been sure what he was going to do. At last, he had turned away, walked to the nearest wall, and slid down it to the floor. There he sat with his knees pulled up against his chest, his long, shaggy hair obscuring most of his face, and blood oozing from the torn skin on the knuckles of his right hand. After what felt like minutes, he had reached into his maroon jerkin, for he was wearing the same clothes as earlier, although without the mask, and drawn forth a small stone bottle. He drank several times, and then began to talk. He talked, and she listened. She had no choice. But she did not allow herself to believe what he said. Not at first. For all she knew, everything he said or did was a sham designed to win her confidence. Murtag had started by telling her a rather garbled story about a man named Tormak. Tornak. Which involved a writing mishap and some sort of advice Tornak had given him regarding how an honorable man ought to live. She had been unable to make out whether Tornak was a friend, a servant, a distant relative, or some combination thereof. But whatever he was, it was obvious that he had meant a great deal to Murtag. When he concluded his story, Murtag had said, Galbatorix was going to have you killed. He knew Elva wasn't guarding you as she used to, so he decided it was a perfect time to have you assassinated. I only found out about his plan by chance. I happened to be with him when he gave the orders to the Black Hand. Murtag shook his head. It's my fault. I convinced him to have you brought here instead. He liked that. He knew you would lure Aragon. He knew you would lure Aragon here that much faster. It was the only way I could keep him from killing you. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
and he buried his head in his arms. I would rather have died. I know, he said in a hoarse voice. Will you forgive me? That she had not answered. His revelation only made her more uneasy. Why should he care to save her life, and what did he expect in return? Murtak had said nothing more for a while. Then, sometimes weeping and sometimes raging, he told her of his upbringing in Galbatorix's court, of the distrust and jealousy he had faced as a son of Morzan, of the nobles who had sought to use him to win favor with the king, and of his longing for the mother he barely remembered. Twice he mentioned Aragon and cursed him for a fool favored by fortune. He would not have done so well if our places had been reversed, but our mother chose to take him to Carvajal, not me. He spat on the floor. She found the whole episode maudlin and self-pitying, and his weakness did nothing but inspire contempt in her until she recounted how the twins had abducted him from Farthendur, how they had mistreated him on the way to Urubayan, and how Galbatorix had broken him once they arrived. Some of the tortures he described were worse than her own, and if true, gave her a slight measure of sympathy for his own plight. Thorn was my undoing, Murtag finally confessed. When he hatched for me and we bonded, he shook his head. I love him. How could I not? I love him, e I love him even as Aragon loves Saphira. The moment I touched him, I was lost. Galbatorix used him against me. Thorn was stronger than me. He never gave up. But I could not bear to see him suffer. So I swore my loyalty to the king, and after that... Murtag's lips curled with revulsion. After that, Galbatorix went into my mind. He learned everything about me, and then he taught me my true name, and now I am his. His forever. Then he leaned his head against the wall and closed his eyes, and she watched the tears roll down his cheeks. Eventually he stood, and as he walked toward the door, he paused next to her and touched her on the shoulder. His nails, she noted, were clean and trimmed, but nowhere near as well cared for it as her jailers. <laughs> Why does she have such a weird fingernail thing? Right? He murmured a few words in the ancient language, and a moment later her pain melted away, although her wounds looked the same as ever. As he took his hand away, she said, I cannot forgive, but I understand. Whereupon he nodded and stumbled away, leaving her to wonder if she had found a new ally. So, okay, two things. Firstly, what if Galbatorix does the same thing that he did to Murtag to Nazawada, where he punishes her for not swearing fealty to the point of, like, it's not getting him anywhere? And then he sees if the egg hatches for her so they can use the dragon against her, and it does, and that's what he, like, does, basically. Same thing, you know, rinse and repeat. Worked on Murtag, it'll work on Aswata. Um, and then also, so people can change their names. Not just like you go down to the town hall and you say, hi, I'd like to change my name, please. But like you change your like being or whatever. Yeah. Um, what if, what if, so Murtag like, saves quote unquote Nazawada from getting dead <clears throat> and then he like is drunk and opens up to her like not like but maybe but not like maybe I don't know maybe they like get like a thing like they care for each other and then that changes his name because like Gabatorix himself said like people who don't have families and like can't bear children like those are who his followers are um, and that's probably why he would keep everybody, like, super, like, secluded so they can't, like, m make connections with people. But, like, Murtag stumbling in, drunk, like, you know, he's, like, very, has, like, no inhibitions, basically, and is, like, him, like, him true self. Is that correct? I don't know. Him true self. Him true self? Who am I? Yeah. Like, what is happening? Him true self show. <laughs> so <laughs> him true self show yeah sure. um his, that works his true self whatever so that i feel like they could potentially like make that connection so that murtag's name changes and then maybe that's how he like 
escapes into the night. With Nasawada. Mm-hmm. And they both have dragons. Christmas dragons, if you will. And then they go around the whole of Elegasia delivering presents. Mm-hmm. Delivering presents to all the good girls and boys. And that's why Christmas colors are green and red. You heard it here first. And that's why they give you coal because it's black like Galbatorix's heart. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> And that's how Christmas started. You're welcome. Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> Merry Christmas to all. Merry Nasuada and Murtag Day. That's me kissing you on the forehead. Happy Katie Holmes Day. <laughs> um, so that's what I think in my brain. <clears throat> Nice. So we should change this to red and then green and then red. Oh, I wish you could do green. like alternating and you could pick colors. That'd be cool. But that's too sophisticated. Way too sophisticated. <laughs> that technology doesn't even exist yet. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, th- that's what I think is going to happen. That's an interesting theory and I like it. Thanks. Is that good enough for the board or? That does also contradict my theory that Aragon and Nazawada are going to end up together. Uh Uh-oh. You got competing Mm -hmm. theories, it looks like. It's a lot more. What are you going to do? I can say it's a lot more compelling, though, if... Murtag's name changes, you know? It kind of seems like the only way anyone's going to get out of fucking anything. What do you want to do? I don't know. Let me think on it. Is this a... Do you want to wait till the next episode to make your final decision if it goes up on the theory wall or not? Yeah. Give yourself to some time to think about it? I guess, like, I feel like the theory that Nazawada and Murtag, like, through their mutual suffering, create, like, a bond which changes their names, which gets them out of the clutches of Galbatorix, and then all three dragon riders can, like, you know, and then the gang runs Galbatorix out of Allegasia. Like, that seems a little bit more compelling <clears throat> of an idea than just, like, I, that Nazwad and Aragon end up together because I don't want Aragon and Elf Titties to end up together, which is... Rude. <laughs> probably gonna happen, and also very rude. I don't know. It's definitely a lot more, a lot more compelling of an idea, I think. I don't know. Let me think on it. All right. You think on it. (laughs) (laughs) That's all I have to say, I think. Yeah, we pretty much said all we had to say throughout this chapter. I felt very opinionated as things were happening. Feel Yeah. Also feel like you like jacked up on coffee so you like couldn't hold it to yourself to the end because usually we kind of like wait till the end to like wrap up all of our thoughts but mm-hmm. or to and say that our thoughts. <laughs> this episode's gonna have a lot of stop talking i just want to hear the story go to audible.com <laughs> slash inheritance <laughs> um i feel like i did have one more thing to bring up but i can't remember so Welp, everyone, thank you so much for watching the video. <laughs> Drop it a lot, like, leave us a comment. Maybe you could comment whether um, you like the idea of Murtag and Nasawada. Maybe, like, not falling in love with each other, but, like, making a deep enough connection with each other, which would be interesting through the torturer mm-hmm. and the torturee. But tortured. not, like... Um, but not like a Stockholm Syndrome situation. Yeah. Like a, she feels sorry for him because. Like they're literally both prisoners. They're, yeah, they're yeah. both basically in the same position. Or, and then that's how Murtag is freed from his bindings of Galbatorix. Mm-hmm. And then they both run off together and then the gang chases <laughs> Galbatorix, Gal Baby out of Allegasia as Demi. <laughs> put yeah 
Or do you guys think it's more compelling that Aragon and Nasawada would end up together? Or do you think it's more compelling that Aragon and Arya would end up together? I guess with a Murtag and Nasawada creating a connection, Arya and Aragon could still end up together. Or Aragon could just. Or do you think go Aragon away. should be alone for the rest of his life? <laughs> <laughs> he could just go away and we could just be all about Murtag, but whatever. Or do you guys want Aragon to go away and this all be about Murtag? Let us know in the comment <laughs> section below what you think. And we'll see you in the next one. Okay, I have to push a button, get up, hit another button. Button, button, buttons for everybody everywhere. You put your headphones on. Okay. Oh, okay. What time is it? 3 a.m. Holy shit.